the lectures will be given for the most part by Dr. Norman Cho and by Dr. Jaladarni Lavali and by Dr. Yang Chuan Ye. But we may also have some guest lectures by Shardal Habib and uh, possibly others, but that's the main group of people who are involved. Um, I've usually taught this course before. The book you're using is actually based on uh, a course I started teaching almost 30 years ago and uh, at Case Western Reserve University with another professor, Robert Brown. And interestingly, he has continued to teach this course for the last 30 years and up to very recently, I've usually taught this course, but with many of the new MRI faculty who have come, they've begun taking over more of the responsibilities for this. And this particular year, I am going to be in China most of the semester. So um, I, I will probably be attending some of the Friday morning sessions, the question sessions, or you might call them the tutorial sessions. Uh, this is our first time to really do this in a modern technological forum where we're videotaping it. We're going to offer the tutorial session um, online by Skype or by QQ or whatever modus operandi you're using from China or India or North America. So uh, I gave a first introduction uh, earlier. It's on the website already. Again, that website is themrimidnightclub.com. Uh, you can find that there. And that was about why MRI is such an exciting field to study. Today, I'm going to take you a little deeper down the rabbit hole, and we're going to look at um, some of the fundamental concepts, things that you can grab in part from Chapter 1, and otherwise it will be a potpourri of information that comes from different parts of the textbook. So uh, we'll start here with uh, the first slide. The first slide, even though it's just the beginning of the lecture, is a hint of some of the things that you can do with MRI. So I, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to some of the basic components that actually let you understand some of the concepts of imaging almost right away. Of course, you won't understand them in depth immediately. You may have to read it three or four or five times before you become truly comfortable with it all. But today, I actually want to give you that, that layman's overview of MRI. And in this first image, this is an image of the blood vessels in the brain, we call it an MR angiogram. And it's possible because of something we call gradient echo imaging, which I will be introducing you to in part today. So amazingly, it's back about 1940s time period that Bloch and Purcell were working in nuclear magnetic resonance. No imaging yet. And the wonderful thing is, in their studies of magnetic moments and studying the behavior of an atom with non-zero magnetic moments, they really began the research in this field. And some of the things they write about in their early papers from the 1940s are incredibly precocious. So much so that some of the content of those papers was only rediscovered in imaging 40 or 50 years later. Uh, even though we won't go into discussing those papers in detail for this course, there may be a follow-up course to this for a more advanced look into MRI. And although quantum physics was necessary to formulate both the experimental and the theoretical results, the final impact is actually based on a very simple expression given by the Larmor equation. So if we denote the precessional frequency by omega and the local magnetic field by B, then the precessional frequency for a given nucleus is given by omega equals gamma B. And in fact, MR is not too much more complicated than that simple linear equation. Well, there's just a lot of manipulations and clothing that we put on top of it to uh, make it work better. So this picture I also mentioned in my last talk, this is an example of a T1-weighted image, but it's actually a visualization of the quantum mechanics associated with magnetic resonance imaging. The only reason we can acquire that picture today is because of the early work by Purcell and Bloch and many others. So this is a representation of how much information we're getting from each voxel in the brain that has to do with the fact that we're lying inside a magnet 
and that these spins that precess around that magnetic field in the protons in our body actually make it possible to create an image like this. So how is that the case? So let's start with the Larmor equation. If we're looking at um, the actual precession of a spin one-half particle like a proton, it will precess as follows, omega equals minus gamma b. And the reason for the minus sign here is that if you use the right hand and you curl your fingers of the right hand to follow the right hand rule, it means positive rotations are counterclockwise. So a clockwise rotation is in fact negative in that reference frame. So that's where the negative sign comes from here. Again, B is the applied magnetic field, gamma is the gyromagnetic ratio, and omega is the frequency. And so you can see in this image that as this spin precesses, it goes through some angle d phi, it makes an angle theta to the main field, and mu represents the magnetic moment of that spin. So what happens here if you get inside a very large magnetic field? So you know that MR systems are these big cylindrical hollow tubes. And if you get in that tube, which is represented by the cylinder here, all of the spins in your body will tend to get magnetized along that magnetic field. Now it turns out that this is not a very efficient process. So at about half a Tesla, you're going to find out that only one spin in two million and one spins will end up pointing along the direction of the main magnetic field. So you can see it's very inefficient approach to doing this. If we were willing to cool ourselves down to a fraction of a degree Kelvin, we could recover that other factor of a million that's missing here because the cooler we get, the more and more those spins will tend to align along the main magnetic field. But we're kind of hot people. You know, we're at around 300 degrees K. So in that case, these spins are bouncing around a lot. They have a lot of thermal energy and they have enough energy that even though they would like to point along that main field, they kind of get bounced around so that they're going like this. And that means that basically on average, there are no spins pointing along the main field or there is no spin excess pointing along the main field. So when you get in this magnet, you are magnetized already. And the problem is that I don't know that you are. I don't know how to measure the presence of that yet because that magnetization is all pointing along Let's call it the z-direction in this case. So how can I measure the fact that you have a magnetization and maybe even image that magnetization? So what we do is we put a radio frequency coil, which is basically as simple as a loop of wire, and we oscillate the current in that coil at the same precessional frequency given by omega equals gamma b. And basically what that does is that puts me in the same rotating reference frames as those spins in the protons in your brain, for example. Now, once I'm there, I can actually interact with that spin because we're now both processing the same way. Just imagine you're getting on a merry-go-round, for example. Now you can talk to that person. But when that person is spinning at 42.6 megahertz at one Tesla, it's impossible to talk to him, can't interact with him. So you have to jump on that, that merry-go-round. You have to jump into the rotating reference frame in order to interact with him. At that point, if you want to give him a little tilt, in this case, if I want to push him down 90 degrees, I can do that because when you have this current in a coil, you create a magnetic field. That magnetic field is also, of course, oscillating, but in the rotating frame, it's a constant magnetic field. So if that effective magnetic field sits along the y-axis, for example, or in, or in this case, if we take the, the um, axis coming out of here to be the x-axis, then it will rotate the magnetization down from this direction into the y-axis. And as soon as it gets there, I'm going to turn that RF coil off. I'm going to shut the current off, not drive the spins anymore, and now your magnetization is sitting perpendicular to where it was originally, but it will continue to process around that main field. So it will maintain its precession, it will maintain its precession rate. So all of a sudden I've created a transverse component of this magnetization. 
And if I'm able to measure that, it would look like this signal shown at the bottom of this graph, where you can see this signal is oscillating at a given frequency, which should be the Larmor frequency. So how can I measure the presence of that magnetization? If I take a loop of wire, for example, and I have this rotating magnet, and I put the surface of this coil, so the coil's like this, the surface is here, and I sweep that magnetization through that coil, I'm changing the flux in that coil. Hence, by Lenz's law, I'm actually generating a, a changing voltage, something that I can measure using this coil. So I can now pick up the current that's created in that coil, I can record that current, and that current tells me you're in the magnet, you have a bulk magnetization, it's now processing around that main magnetic field. So how can we use this to do imaging? So we're going to start off with a very simple idea. Gradient echoes and one-dimensional imaging, just to get the concept across. So let's go back again here to the Larmor equation, and let's rewrite this. Instead of just writing omega equals minus gamma b, let's replace the phase as omega t and replace omega with gamma b. And what do we get for phase but minus gamma b t? So this phase that we saw here earlier is just represented by this expression minus gamma b t. The longer you wait, the more phase you have precessed through, right? Remember that the gyromagnetic ratio, which in these units is gamma bar or gamma divided by 2 pi, and that should be a gamma bar here, is 42.6 megahertz per Tesla. So at 2 Tesla, you're at 85.2 megahertz. So you can see you're getting right up into the FM range in terms of what you listen to on your radio. So I still can't image you yet. I can detect your presence. But what I want to do is use this understanding of the Larmor equation to do the following. So instead of having all the spins, and let's take the one dimension being here, my nose, my two eyes, and my ears, for example. So now I have this one dimension, we'll call it the x direction, and they all are processing at the same rate in the main field. So if I jump into the rotating frame, they're all going to sit there at rest. So what if instead I purposely change the magnetic field to make it a little bit lower here and a little bit higher here? That means this spin will precess faster. The spin at my nose will be at the origin, it won't change. And the spin for my left eye will precess slower, which means it effectively goes backwards. So what's happening is these spins are all starting to run away from each other like this. If I make the field different at every point in my brain. So, that dispersion of the spins, I can use as a method to figure out where each of those spins lies. So you could imagine that if I'm able to tell you the spectral amplitude of each of these spins, then I'm going to find out how much spin density or how many spins are in my left eye, how many spins are in my right eye, just by pulling out the signal from low frequency versus the signal from high frequency. So this is the basic aha that Paul Lauterbur and Peter Mansfield came up with some 30 plus years ago that won them the Nobel Prize back in 2004. So how do we represent that here? So we're going to look at something called the sequence diagram. The sequence diagram basically tells me how I run this experiment. So RF stands for the radio frequency pulse and this little square blip here means that I'm applying that pulse to the whole object. So I'm trying to tip the spins throughout that object. The G stands for the gradient that I'm applying. And in this case, I'm applying the gradient in the up-down direction, or say the Z direction. And this is a negative gradient here. So the longer that gradient is on, the more those spins will dephase, right? Because I'm making the field lower here, higher here. So if I leave it on, they'll keep running away. But if I turn that gradient off, they'll stay right where they were because now I've changed their phase, right? So what can I do next with them? Well, I can keep playing with them. And the wonderful thing about MR is you have the ability to manipulate or massage what the spins are doing to get them to do almost anything you want. 
Interestingly, as you'll learn later on the course, you can even manipulate how you collect the data to automatically process the data for you in some cases. So in this example now, what we're going to do is take that gradient, turn it off. We're going to wait a little bit, this time here between um, T2 and T3. And then we're going to flip the gradient. So now the field is bigger here and smaller here. So what's that going to do? Now my thumb is going to move forward. My little finger is going to move backwards. And if I wait exactly the same amount of time that I had applied that gradient the first time and then turn it off again, they will all be back where they started from. And so we call this an echo. So this represents a gradient field echo. So by manipulating the spins like this, and then in this case, leaving that gradient actually on again for the same length of time that I had used to rephase it, it will dephase again. So I have all of these different signals, and you'll notice that now the signals don't look very smooth. It just doesn't decay exponentially. It has this beat frequency associated with it. And you know if you take two signals that have different frequencies and combine them together, they will end up with this beat frequency response, right? I should be able to take that signal now and do some type of spectral analysis on that signal and then figure out how many spins are in every part of my face here, just like I explained to you. So how do we do that? We do that through something called the Fourier transform. So I don't know if you've all seen the Fourier transform before, but it's something you should be familiar with, something you should definitely uh, read up on. You will learn more about it in chapters 10 and 11 and 12 and 13. Um, in this particular example, I'm going to talk first about what the form of this integral is. Because you don't really need strong mathematics to understand the Fourier transform. In fact, you really just need a picture of how these spins behave. So first, let's talk about integral. What does that mean? An integral is the sum of all the different signals across this one dimension that we were looking at. OK, that's simple. Um, what is rho of x? Rho of x represents the spin density at any given location x. So spin density means the number of spins per unit volume. So if I have more spins, I should have more signal, right? Now, what's this other term? e to the i phi. So if I have this expression, e to the i phi, you know that that can be rewritten as cosine phi plus i sine phi. So you can break it up into a cosine and sine term or into a real and imaginary term. OK, so what does this phi represent? The phi represents simply the angle through which those spins moved at every point in time. So you see, I have this t here. So if I look at s of t, s of t simply says, look, take the sum of all these spins here. Let's call that t equals 0 for now. Remember when they echo, I'm going to call that echo now my origin, t equals 0. So the sum would be roughly 5 units for argument's sake. Now, as I go away to the next time point, different from 0, they've started spreading apart. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking rho of x times this angle that my thumb makes to the main axis here. That's my phi. And then I'm adding that to this vector, making this angle. I add up all the x components, all the y components, and that just gives me the sum of all these different spin vectors. And that's my s of t. So it's really quite simple. If you just drew it as a bunch of vectors on the blackboard, you'd break them up into their x components, their y components, and add them together. So this formula really is nothing more than adding up a bunch of vectors. So we can rewrite this formula in a slightly different way. In this case, I really just want two variables. I want to talk about either frequency and time, or I want to talk about space and spatial frequency. So we rewrite this term gamma bar gt as k. And k is going to be referred to as my k-space value in the future. And if I substitute that into the first formula, then we get this term s of k equals the integral over x of rho of x times e to the minus i 2 pi kx. So again, a very simple linear relationship between the phase and the location. Remember, that rate at which that phase is changing depends on my location x, right? 
Okay, now we are really in the form of a Fourier transform. And what is the inverse of that Fourier transform? What gives me the spectral components rho of x? Well, I take s of k, I multiply by e to the plus i 2 pi kx, and integrate. And now I have found rho of x. So in fact, I've just created my object. I now have done my first MR imaging experiment. So how do we represent that effect of k pictorially? Well, again, if k is equal to gamma bar gt, actually a little more accurately, k is equal to the integral of gamma g of t dt, then if we look at this lower picture, we call this the k-space diagram, you can see that at the very beginning of the experiment, if there's no gradient on, there's no phase, therefore k must be zero. Now, first we turn the gradient negative. So in k-space, I start going backwards. I stop, I turn the gradient off. Now I turn it on again, but this time I switch the direction. And what happens in k-space is I start running forwards. So you can see in this picture that when we get to that, back to that origin, zero, we have created an echo. And then if I keep collecting that data, I collect more time points or more coverage of k. Well, we're not going to go into this detail today, but let me just tell you that the more coverage of k-space you have, the better resolution you get. So if I'm willing to take more and more time, I can get higher and higher resolution in my image. And this is another way now to represent doing imaging, but not in one dimension, in two dimensions. So let's try to understand this a little bit. First, we have the RF pulse. That's the pulse that tips the spins into the transverse plane. Then I have my, on, on this picture, then I have another gradient. In this case, it's called the slice select gradient. Well, I haven't talked about that yet, so let's talk about that a little bit. Let's say I don't want to image the entire cylinder. I really just want to image this strip by my eyes in my head here. How can I just excite those spins? So if during the time I turn this RF pulse on, I also turn this gradient on in the Z direction, that means I'm creating different frequencies along the Z direction. So if I excite this at the Larmor frequency plus or minus some bandwidth that I choose, only those spins in that bandwidth will get excited. So it's possible for me to, again, as I said, manipulate these spins so that I only excite in the area that I'm interested in taking the image for. So we're going to assume for the moment that I'm just going to excite a thin slice here. And now I don't want a one-dimensional picture. I want a two-dimensional picture like that first picture I showed you at the beginning. So how do we do that? Well, again, we want to encode the phase, but this time, instead of encoding the phase in the x direction, I need to encode the phase in the y direction. So how can I do that? I can't really turn these gradients on at the same time because if you, if you take both gradients in x and y, it's going to create some angled gradient, and that's just a single gradient, so it will only encode things perpendicular to it. Okay, that's no good. So instead, what I need to do is I'm going to have you focus on the red lines here. The red line represents a gradient in the y direction. So every time I apply an RF pulse, I'm going to apply a gradient in the y direction. So I'm going to change the spin phase a little bit in this direction the first time I do the experiment. And then I'm going to turn that gradient off, and then I'm going to encode an X. Then I'm going to come back and start the experiment all over again. I'm going to apply another RF pulse, and then I'm going to encode even a little bit longer. And I'm going to do this again and again and again. And when I have done this enough times to get the resolution that I want, I will have encoded the entire Y direction so that I can create an image that has equal resolution in X and Y, for example. So in order to do that, it takes time. And in the early days, the time between these RF pulses was on the order of about a second. And so in order for me to cover the entire brain, let's say I had a field of view of 240 millimeters, which is a pretty good field of view to cover the brain. And I collected 240 phase encoding steps in the Y direction. So that's going to take me four minutes to collect that data. So that's a, a very long time. You'll learn later in the course that today we've managed to make these methods go much, much faster so that 
instead of covering the brain in four minutes, we can now cover the brain in seconds in some cases. It all depends on the type of contrast we want. Now the image on the right hand side is a little bit more complicated picture of case space again. Now remember in one dimension we went backwards first and then came forward. Now in this particular example, if we use the negative most y gradient first, we start at the origin, we go backwards and down. So that puts me at the first negative gradient. And then I let time go on and I take my measurements here. As I keep changing this, finally I end up at the positive most gradient. I still go backwards because I'm always going backwards on the read gradient. And then I go forward again once I have turned off that y gradient. So these lines represent two-dimensional, in this case, a Cartesian grid coverage of k-space. When I have that data, I can do a Fourier transform in x to resolve this direction. Then I can do a Fourier transform in y to do to resolve the perpendicular direction, and now I have all the information I need to get a two-dimensional picture out of this. So now what happens? I've tried to encode my data, but you know the world doesn't stay still while we're doing these things. So once I have created my transverse magnetization, first, right after that, I have no z component. But don't forget, these spins are all processing in this very strong magnetic field. So, of course, they try to get pulled back up along that main field again, right? So this longitudinal magnetization, which we call MZ, is going to grow again over time. That means I better do my experiment quickly enough here and then let it grow back so that I have lots of MZ component before I do the next experiment. And it's given by this simple expression that MZ of T equals M naught times 1 minus e to the minus t over t1. And t1 is known as a characteristic time or a relaxation time or the longitudinal relaxation time. And you can see here that what will happen is eventually when t goes to infinity, the longitudinal magnetization will return to its equilibrium value, m0. At that point, you're ready to do the experiment again. But of course, nobody wants to wait an infinite amount of time to redo that experiment. So usually you'll, you'll wait several values of T1. You might wait two times T1 or three times T1, at which point you would be up at around 95 to 99% of your maximum signal. And that's good enough. So what are these values that we have for T1? Well. They're on the order of about a second. If you look at gray matter at 1.5 Tesla, at least given in this table, I think this table is even in our book, is 950 milliseconds. So on the order of a second. So if, if you have to wait two or three times that, boy, you're not going to be four minutes. You'd be eight minutes or 12 minutes collecting the data. So it, it can in principle, and it did in practice, take a long time to collect that data. Different tissues have different values of T1 associated with. Now, something else happens as well. You get T2 decay. Now, again, let's look at what happens. If I bring these spins all down here like this, and I had a perfect world, and I had a perfectly homogeneous magnetic field, they would all sit there. But you know the molecules are bouncing around. They see different local magnetic fields created by all the other structures in your body and in your tissue. So in fact, unfortunately, they tend to bounce around a bit, and their spins start to deface. So we call this T2 effect dephasing. And this is another characteristic time of the tissue that you're in. So if, if, if you're inside of a solid and you have these strong magnetic fields in the solid, they'll run away from each other very quickly. And that means that the T2 value will be very short. And in fact, for solids, I think we're talking on the order of microseconds, perhaps. In human tissue, we're generally looking at things that are 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. That's enough time that we can actually apply our gradients, collect the data before the signal disappears. Because otherwise, it looks like this in the picture here, and it's rapidly decaying. So you really want to collect that um, data as quickly as possible. 
So sometimes this is also called the spin-spin interaction that describes the rate of decay of the transverse component, which is called MXY here. But that T2 decay is actually related to another experiment we call a spin echo experiment. I'm not sure I'm actually going to have too much time to talk about that here, but I, I will come back to that. And the spin echo experiment, it can do a little bit of magic and it can bring the spins back together even when there is an inhomogeneous magnetic field. But when we do gradient echo imaging, we don't have that luxury. We're really stuck with all these field variations that are there. And here you can see again in this table that the T2 values are on the order of 100 milliseconds, 80, 50. For, for water, for CSF, it's actually quite long. This picture you're looking at here is an example of a T2 weighted picture. It's a picture where we purposely waited a long enough time period, maybe 80 milliseconds, so that the signal from gray matter and white matter has been significantly suppressed compared to the water in your brain, compared to the CSF. And so you see the CSF stays very bright. This type of image has been used to study um, inflammation, to study to the presence of tumors, the presence of edema in tissue, and it's one of the more important and most important early methods used in MRI. Now, T2 star then is very complicated. T2 star contains the term T2 in the following form. So 1 over T2 star equals 1 over T2 plus 1 over T2 prime. And T2 prime is that extra term that causes dephasing separate from these random molecular interactions that take place. So this term T2 is irreversible, cannot be removed, even by magic experiments, even by spin echo experiments. The T2 prime can be removed by a spin echo experiment, but not by a gradient echo experiment. So this is the difference between a gradient echo and a T2 in terms of its T2 decays. So again, just to remind you, what are we looking at here? We start off with a magnetization along Z. We rotate the magnetization, get it in the transverse plane first. We do that so that we can use a radio frequency coil to pick up the signal. We let that precess. And then over time, what happens is those spins dephase as shown in the bottom right picture. And we call this a T2 star decay. If we write out the expression for this for the transverse magnetization, it's very simple. It's the transverse magnetization as a function of echo time TE is equal to the original transverse magnetization times E to the minus TE over T2 star. So these expressions that we're talking about in terms of T1 and T2, the Fourier transform, these should all be things that you sleep with and you talk to and you understand 100%. Because if you don't understand these components that I'm introducing you to now, you will not be able to do the later parts of the course. So it's absolutely critical you make sure you understand these early components. So how can we get rid of some of that dephasing effect? Well, this is an example picture now of, or sequence diagram, showing you how to do different types of RF pulses to bring the spins back together again. And it really is a little bit magic. So let's take a look at it this way. Say we rotate the spins 90 degrees. We know that after a certain time, tau, they run apart like this. Now let's rotate the spins instead of along, say, the x-axis, or about the x-axis, we rotate about the y-axis. Now watch my thumb. So my thumb is originally moving backwards like this. And now I rotate it here. Look what I've done to it. I've put it on the opposite side, but it's still running backwards. I didn't move it physically. It still sees the same gradient, the same magnetic field effect. So its frequency stays the same. And where does it go? It comes back together again. So in fact, if the time between the pi by two pulse and the pi pulse is equal to the time that we measure after the pi pulse, I get an echo. We call that a spin echo. The first echo I taught you was a gradient echo. This is now a spin echo. So you can really bring those spins back together again. Well, this is a bit of an exaggeration here, whoever drew this picture, but the T2 decay is a simple exponential decay. The T2 star 
in between these pulses more rapidly reduces the signal. But lo and behold, at the spin echo time, it actually comes right back to where it would have been had there been no inhomogeneities, no bulk magnetic inhomogeneities present. They're not random, they're static inhomogeneities. So here's an example of a number of different types of images you can get in MR. You can have a conventional T1 weighted gradient echo image where the white matter appears bright, the gray matter is dark, and the CSF is very dark. So how do we understand that? If we take the TR and we make it very short, so short that the signal from the water, which is trying to grow up very slowly, remember its T1 value was 4,500 milliseconds, then it doesn't have time to go back to where it was before. So the total signal that will be available to you in that picture will be quite small. It will be dark. So here you can see it's dark also. Now the white matter, on the other hand, has a much shorter T1, so it grows up very fast. So it has a lot more signal ready for you the next time you do an RF pulse. And you can see that the white matter has the higher signal here. We can use these techniques to image blood vessels. We can create a more heavily weighted T2 star image by using a longer echo time. We can create a T2 image that doesn't have those T2 star effects at all and shows the water content very well. There are other tricks I'm not going to talk to you about today, but there are methods that we can use a, a technique called inversion recovery with, in this case, double inversion recovery, that lets me image just the gray matter or lets me image just the white matter and suppresses the signal from the other tissues. This can be very important in studying certain diseases like multiple sclerosis. And we can just focus on imaging the spin density itself if we want to. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So again, here's the spin echo sequence. And it's possible to actually not just collect one piece of information from this scan. But if we put many gradient echoes on before this spin echo, so I put an oscillating gradient on here. I keep oscillating that gradient so it goes on and off and on and off. So it creates dephasing, rephasing, dephasing, rephasing. I can collect a whole series of echoes around that spin echo. And this is basically what that sequence looks like. So here's your readout. Here's your pi pulse. And here are all these echoes that I'm going to collect. And they're mostly gradient echoes, except the one that's collected right at the spin echo time. And now instead of getting one picture for the price of, say, a four-minute scan or an eight-minute scan, I can now get as many pictures as I can collect echoes. So, again, to remind you that when we're not exactly at the spin echo time, we're not looking at R2, we're looking at R2 star. Remember, R2 is 1 over T2. R2 star is 1 over T2 star. So this signal decays first and then gets refocused and then decays again. So we can also look at optimizing the signal we have from the different tissues. Now to do this, that means we're not going to do a 90 degree pulse and then a 180. Instead, we might do something like a 130 degree pulse. And now we've created a negative component for the longitudinal magnetization. So we're purposely adjusting its ability to grow back up. And then we invert the pulse. Now we can change the type of contrast. We can make the gray matter brighter, the white matter less bright, and the CSF the darkest. So we can play a lot of games here. This is just some examples now showing you what can be done with that particular spin echo gradient echo sequence. So you can create a conventional T1 weighted sequence. You can create a conventional T2 star weighted sequence. But you can do something more interesting. If I have collected a data point along every one of those exponentially decaying points, I can actually calculate R2, R2 or R2 star. So we call those R2 maps or R2 star maps. And this is an example of an R2 map. So it's a direct measurement of what the, the T2 value is for every one of those tissues. And as you can see that, that if T2 is small, i.e. they dephased a lot, then R2 is very bright. So let me tell you about this structure. This is the globus pallidus. The globus pallidus has a lot of iron in it. And of course, if I have a lot of iron present, I create these big magnetic fields. And they cause a very rapid decay of my signal. So in this case, R2 is going to tend to be very bright because T2 is very small.
And now we can use that as a means to map out how much iron is in the tissue. So MR has the ability not just to produce pretty pictures, but to actually look at quantifying content that's present. In this case, quantifying iron content. All right, so something else happens here. If we want to image very quickly, and again, I start by tipping my spins 90 degrees. And let's say the spins grow back up so that they look like my hand here. The next time I tip it, it will only be the length of my hand. All right, so the first time it's got M naught, I tip it down, it's got a lot of signal. But the second time when it grows back up like this and I hit tip it 90 degrees, it only has this much signal. So actually the very first time I do the experiment doesn't count. Right? It, it just, I can't use that because it's not got the same information content in it. So I usually throw that away. Well, it turns out that what if I don't rotate this 90 degrees? What if instead, because I want to keep a lot of longitudinal magnetization, I don't want to wait four minutes to do my experiment. I don't want to wait one second TR for this to grow back up. So what if instead I just tip this 30 degrees? Ah, well, that's interesting. What's the sign of 30 degrees? It's 0.5. So that means by tipping it just 30 degrees, I have 50% of my transverse magnetization present. But I still have 0.867, cosine of 30 degrees, 0.867 of my original magnetization is still here. Well, isn't that wonderful? That means that by using a lower flip angle, I can actually run this scan much faster because basically I don't have to wait at all. I can almost just do this in the matter of milliseconds. So in fact, we can now run the experiment with the TR of maybe 50 milliseconds. So if I have to collect that data 200 times in the process, it only takes me 10 seconds to collect that picture. So of course, that's just a single two-dimensional picture that I collected. But nevertheless, if you have to collect one part of the body very quickly, say you wanted to monitor the motion of someone's knee moving, for example, you could do that very quickly. In fact, today we can image much faster than that. So my point here with this plot is that when I tip this 30 degrees and I have this magnetization point 867, it still grows back up. It doesn't quite reach equilibrium yet. It takes it a certain number of pulses to reach equilibrium, not one pulse, but the shorter the TR, the faster it will reach equilibrium. And that's what this shows you here, that fat has the shortest T1. It reaches equilibrium the quickest. Water has the longest T1. It takes a long, long time. It takes almost 150 RF pulses before it reaches equilibrium, which means I would have to wait 150 RF pulses before I could actually use that data. So here is pictorially what we've been talking about. Here you can see that the original longitudinal magnetization starts at zero and grows back up, according to this formula we saw at the very beginning. And here you can see the transverse magnetization at the same time is decaying away. So in the end, what do we end up with? We end up with the following equation. And this is a representation of the information content I have for any given tissue. So each tissue has its own T1 value. Each tissue has its own T2 value. And each tissue has its own spin density. So if we want to understand the signal recovery that's taking place here and how much signal we have when we reach equilibrium, then we need this equation. So it's a bit complicated, but again, it's actually not so difficult. So I show you this not to try to teach you all of these concepts today, because this is already chapter 18 in the book. So it's going to take you a while to get back to this point. But again, to teach you that you shouldn't just write equations down. You should stop and think carefully about what they mean. So let's try to analyze this equation really without a lot of experience in MR, since you've really only been listening to me for about 45 minutes so far. So I wouldn't call you experts yet. Um, how can we understand the signal response here? Well, first, what if I tip this zero degrees or a very, very tiny angle? There's no transverse magnetization, right? So how much signal do you expect to see? Almost nothing. So does that make sense here? If sine theta, if theta is small, sine theta becomes theta, and as theta goes to zero, that goes to zero. Okay? Now, what about if we look at 90 degrees? Well, remember, 90 degrees also has a problem. So this expression, E1, 
is e to the minus tr over t1. So if tr is very short, what does that expression look like? Well, e to the minus x is just 1 minus x in that case. So 1 minus 1 minus x is just x. Therefore, at 90 degrees, the signal looks like tr over t1. Well, what if I run tr of 20 milliseconds, and what if t1 is 2,000 milliseconds? Then my signal would be 1 over 100, which is also basically 0. So either we're really out of luck here, and that the signal is basically 0 everywhere, or there is a maximum in there somewhere. Well, you know from this simple example of 30 degrees that I can actually get a pretty big signal, right? So somewhere in there, there must be an optimal angle that gives me the maximum signal associated with this. And how would you calculate that? If you have a formula like this, f of theta, you'll take the derivative of f of theta with respect to theta, set it equal to zero, and find out that value of theta that maximizes the signal. And if you do that, you're going to get something like this. So here's a plot of that formula for gray matter, white matter, and CSF. And you can see that somewhere around in this example, maybe 15 degrees for the gray matter, maybe 20 degrees, not quite 20 degrees for the white matter, you have peak signal. And actually, the signal is reasonably high. You'd have to calculate what percentage of m naught that represents, but you can see that you're not going to run this at zero, you're not going to run it at 90 degrees, you're going to run it here to get the best response possible. So let me show you a few pictures of what this looks like. And, um, and then I think, actually, I, I'm going to stop for today to just kind of give you this flavor of what you're going to cover in the book. But again, I want to use this logic we had a minute ago. When I go to very low flip angles, the only thing really left in that expression is, well, let's see, 1 minus e1 divided by 1 minus e1 cos theta. Cos of 0 is 1. So the 1 minus e1s cancel out. All right, let's assume I'm using a very short echo time. So that term would also be 1. Now I'm just left with rho naught times sine theta. Now when theta is small, that's just theta. So I just have rho naught times theta. So this picture that we have here using a very small flip angle, what does that represent? It's just rho naught. So what does that picture represent? It represents how many spins there are in each of those tissues, basically. So if you were to measure a signal of 100 inside the CSF, for argument's sake, here, you might find that it's only 80% here, and it's only 65% here. So actually, you now have a rough relative measurement of the spin densities of the different tissues you're looking at. Now, what happens is I make that flip angle larger. I start introducing this T1 component into it. Okay, now it doesn't look the same at all. You can see that very quickly, even for five degrees, the CSF had such a long T1 that with a TR of 20 milliseconds, you gave it no time to grow back up. So of course, it's already turning dark. But luckily, the gray matter, white matter, they have much shorter T1, so they look okay. And if we make the flip angle bigger again, now you can see what happens. Everything inverts. You can see that the gray matter has, sorry, the white matter now has the highest signal because it has the shortest T1. The CSF is really dark, and the gray matter is a little bit darker than the white matter. And finally, if I use a larger flip angle again, I get this very beautiful T1 weighted image that can be run extremely quickly. It can be run actually to cover the entire brain. And generally in the matter of a few minutes. So normally, with very high resolution images, today in three or four minutes, we can get roughly one cubic millimeter voxel size. So you have to go and think about that for a minute. You know, when you look at, at that, that means you have 256 pixels across your screen in both directions, x and y, and maybe you have 120, 160 slices. That's a lot of data that you're looking at. And that's what the physicians have to look at today. Um, many other things can be done with this data. You can imagine that a physician might come along and ask you, well, you know, as you get older, the gray matter starts to disappear. The, the gray matter atrophies. I want to know how much gray matter is there. Well, you'd be surprised. The ability to segment out CSF from white matter from gray matter has been an ongoing challenge in this field for over 30 years.
And although there are now programs out there that do a reasonably good job, they, some of them still don't do a good job. And so the interesting back and forth challenge is you need to know your mathematics well. You need to be a good engineer to build these systems. You need to be able to do image processing to extract the useful information that you want. But more importantly, you need to be a good MR physicist because you want to know how to design that sequence so that you get the best possible contrast between your tissues. So let's just stop and look at this last picture again for a minute. If I want to segment out gray matter and white matter, I have a much better chance of doing it with this picture than I do with this one. So if you know how to manipulate the MR imaging parameters so that you can create the best contrast possible, then you're going to make it possible to answer important clinical questions. And so that's a lot of what MR is about today, designing new methodologies, methodologies, designing the ability to image tissue, to image blood vessels, to image blood flow, to image iron content, to look at diffusion in the brain, and many, many other properties that people have brilliantly thought of over the last 30 plus years in this field. So I, I hope you enjoy you know, your slower trek through the book. Um, it'll probably take you a few months to get to chapter 18, but uh, maybe by then you'll kind of look back at this lecture and go, oh yes, now I really understand what he was talking about. All right, thank you very much, everybody.